responding to the climate emergency is something that it makes sense for everyone to want to do. And we're all sort of figuring it out as best we can. But it's also a, it's, it's a cultural emergency, right? I mean, this is my, my big thing is that the climate is a product of a very flawed culture, right? The premise of our culture, particularly in our production of food, is, is flawed in relation to how nature actually works. So I'm Phoebe Godfrey. I'm an associate professor in residence at UConn in the Department of Sociology. I've been here since 2007. And uh, in my early days here at UConn, one of the things that struck me was that there was no student farm uh, for an ag school to not have a place where students could really come together and, and practice communal growing and, and working and learning and engagement. Uh, and not only teach them where food comes from, but allow them to have that embodied and visceral and experiential experience of growing food and harvesting food and composting food and, and watching the cycle of life that our culture does not do very well. And so it, the idea for a, for a farm was like, oh, you know, let's find some land. And with a lot of support from housing department and dining services and then connection with Julia Cartabiano uh, and some other folks from the Ag School, we were able to kind of create Spring Valley Student Farm. Uh, very small and it's still relatively small considering, uh, you know, that we have about 20,000 students at UConn uh, and the, the capacity here is for 11. But it does a really important piece of work, and that work is to teach students where food comes from. I'm Phoebe Rosinski. I'm a student farmer at the University of Connecticut, living at Spring Valley Student Farm. Spring Valley is really interested in providing a space for youth to be involved, maybe for the first time, at least be introduced to the farm setting. Everyone has all different talents that come in with some people are majoring in agriculture, some people are engineers, some people like have never <laughs> eaten a vegetable, you never know, <laughs> sometimes that happens. But um, everyone has their own talents and can build off of that. And because it's a small community with 11 farmers, we all have to sometimes step up and take over things that you might not know how to do. So by doing that, it's a big learning curve and leadership experience. Food system is super important. I don't think I started learning about it until later in my life, but knowing how food grows, like what plant, what the plant looks like, and what all the other effects of the food system, the pesticides, pollinators, what's native and what's not native is important. You need to know what you're eating and where it comes from. Knowing that you can make better choices in what you eat and knowing how it affects the world around you. Sustainability should be for everyone, not just for people that major in sustainability or people that can afford to make sustainable choices. So even from a young age, like an introduction makes a lot of a difference to people. You know, in agriculture itself is a very new part of the human experience. It's only 10,000 years old. For 99% of human history, we've been hunter-gatherers. Uh, and so you start to see, you know, the agriculture system as, as, a, as, as a, a new part of human evolution that in many ways has unfortunately led us to the ecological and climate crisis that we are. We're basically eating the planet, right? So, you know, as you buy food, 
you are not engaging in a in a social relationship that you have a right to eat you're always gauging in a, a capitalist economic relationship where if you don't have money you don't eat or we shame you and say well go get free food and the free food you get is usually subpar right so the idea that people have a right to healthy food they have a right to to access to land to grow their own food i mean that's kind of mind-boggling and that's part of also what I think this farm is for you know it's, it's teaching students that you have a right to be able to grow food a community garden is like a garden for the community you can come and pick uh, what you want. Don't take a lot. Just take what you need. There's a lot of plants. There's a lot of medicinal herbs like uh, lavender and white sage. And then we have strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, uh, squash, cucumbers, and a lot more. Rochester overall is surrounded by farmland, which is good. It really, it really shouldn't be the way it is. But there are certain communities that don't get the same access to fresh food especially or even to cheap food that a lot of the suburbs of Rochester enjoy. So a lot of those places are the places that are really hard hit whenever there's any kind of economic upheaval and those are the places that it's most important to get kind of gardens to so that people have a little bit of, of a, a way to get fresh fruits and vegetables for their kids and for themselves that normally they just might not have access to cheaply. I am Bennett Salamosi of Urban Worman, and I'm teaching a workshop here for the kids from Afristine. A little uh, locally based kind of sustainability initiative trying to create a vermicomposting program in the city of Rochester uh, by putting worm composting bins in a bunch of the local community gardens and uh, teaching programs to local youth. So today we had a workshop here at 490 Farmers with the kids from the Afristine Garden Club. Um, where I put in worms for them and, and into these special bins that they already built, they were good with that. And uh, just showed them how to upkeep it, showed them how to maintain it, taught them a little bit about the worms and why this is so important, just keeping the food screen closed and preventing waste. Uh, and I do the same kind of thing with, uh, I've already put in a bin here at 490 Farmers and Taproot Collective and a couple other places in the city, as well as providing them to private individuals for their homes and kitchens and gardens just to close their personal waste streams, especially in a city. It isn't that easy to get your kids out doing things that are enriching for them just in the immediate uh, sense. I know I spend too much time on my phone and so they, these kids do too and that's what their parents were saying, just getting them out of the house in the sunlight, touching a tomato, running around, gotta be really good for them and I'm just glad to be a part of that. <laughs> Growing food is an activist act in this culture and in this time. You know, whether it's in an urban area, reclaiming, you know, parking lots and depaving and and or whether rooftops or whether claiming grassland that is is degraded. All, you know, those are activist statements uh, and things that students can do anywhere at any time. It's like, I want food and in a way have that freedom. I mean, growing your own food is the ultimate freedom because then you, you know, you cannot be bought because you have your you have your security and in your hands. My name is Caitlin Townsend. Um, I would consider myself a environmental environmentalist. Um, I grew up as a commercial fisherman in Provincetown and um, I'm currently a marine debris intern at the Center for Coastal Studies in P-Town. So lobster fishing is one of the most sustainable practices um, because we're essentially creating habitat on the bottom. Um, we're not dragging across the ocean floor. We're not catching and releasing. Anything that pretty much comes into a trap will either end up, like a lobster will end up being eaten or will end up back in the ocean. Um, and it's awesome that tourists can come and know that they're buying lobsters that were caught locally. Any time you're eating a lobster, or you're eating some scallops in town, you're you're directly supporting fishermen, and that's a big message that I would I want to put out to the world is to look and see where your food comes from. Hi. 
We, um, we go through about 400 pounds of lobsters a day. So we pump the seawater from the bay into the basement and we have a reservoir down there that we create bacteria for the lobsters because the water goes up to the tanks and uh, we keep them here for basically a day or two. So if they're here, they're well taken care of and they're fed, just like you. We've been fortunate enough that we've worked with the same vendors for 30 plus years. So Bob from Billingsgate Clams, he brings us Little Necks. Um, Chris King brings us Sea Scallops. You know, um, Steve Roderick brings us lobster. So it's, we go through the, our, our friends and our family that have been, we've been working with forever, and uh, we get the freshest. It's all locally caught, and that's one of the reasons why I moved here, 1972, was because of the food, year round. My dad started fishing at the age of 13 with a guy in Provincetown. They would steam out to the fishing grounds every day and my dad would drive and uh, then he learned from him and at 18 he bought his own boat. At the time he was fishing year round, he was fishing for cod and haddock in the winter um, and I would go out with him a lot when my mom couldn't watch me. So I was out on the boat from that age and then I remember like being eight years old and running the traps along the rail for him or um, going out mackerel fishing or cod fishing. And it was all just always so exciting to see, to, to go out here and be with my dad and learn from him. And it's been great to be um, in the role I am as a fisherman's daughter because I've seen the, the past of my memory. I mean, I guess 18 years of how life has changed on Cape Cod and how life has changed for the fishermen, how life has changed for the beaches or how the beaches have changed. I've seen all of that. We have seen a decline in the lobster fishery or the lobster, our catch each year. Yesterday, they hauled 100 traps and got 99 pounds. So that is not a lot compared to what five, say five years ago, we would catch on an August day. Um, we'd probably be bragging in a thousand pounds in, in whatever we, over a thousand pounds in whatever we hold that day. Um, and that the main factor that's contributing to the decline of lobsters is the ocean's warming and lobsters like colder water. And there is a very large lob in the bay that's pretty warm water and the lobsters do not like that. So that is contributing to a loss of our catch. It's a huge bummer, but I think that will be able to sustain some sort of fishery, I hope, and I hope that I can be a part of that solution. Human development has been affecting Long Island Sound since before Europeans arrived here in 1612, 1613, although um, it changed drastically and for the worse starting then. The, uh, the big change was that when Europeans got here, they viewed everything as a commodity for the market, um, including beavers and deer, which, you know, through hunting and trapping, they wiped out before the end of the 1600s. As population started to grow, Connecticut became an industrial center. Over the years, the industrial pollution stopped because injuries, in, industries closed up and moved elsewhere, but populations continued to grow and sewage treatment remained inadequate. And the result of that was by the middle, really the 1970s and 1980s, the sound started to experience severe bouts of what they call hypoxia in summer. Hypoxia is caused by nitrogen in sewage, treated sewage and untreated sewage. There was one incident at Wesleyan University in 1884, I think, where half a couple of dozen young men died of typhoid fever from eating contaminated oysters taken from New Haven. I know Save the Sound, where I, I used to work a little bit and which is still doing great work and this has, has made bacterial pollution the focus of their work over the last, almost the last decade. In many ways, they are the voice of the public to the government. I feel like young people are very underrepresented in the environmental movement. Their ability to mass mobilize is incredible. I, I think history shows 
that in addition to demanding legislative action, mass mobilization and uh, widespread communications are, are very important to keeping a movement alive. If students know how to be able to engage with their governments that are implementing these policies, um, they can create, they can help create better policies that reflect our society's best interests. With COVID, it created a lot of logistical challenges for people to being able to get together, but we wanted to be able to design a group that anyone could access, anyone could be a part of. What we thought of was the Youth Eco Advocacy Corps would be a great way to do that. And so our thought process was we could create a monthly round table uh, that allows students from all over Connecticut to interact with each other and hear about other um, environmental issues or topics or policy areas that were relevant in Connecticut that students were working on. So I think young people bring a very global perspective and a perspective that is very culturally relevant and aware and a desire to be inclusive. And this is gonna be very important in conservation as the world goes through a period of time that has a lot of change to our global systems. And as people try to figure out how to navigate living in a world that's changing. As a summit steward, we do a bunch of different things. So one of the first things that we do is leave no trace. Uh, we do that basically in all the different parts of our job, but mostly postering at different trail locations, hopefully getting people right at the start of their trip and making sure that they know how to correctly interact with their environment and not leaving an impact. So within our programs, we try to provide a ladder of engagement for all different ages, um, pre-K all the way through college. And we do that through education programs, field trips, virtual programming with um, education rangers at the national park. One of the best parts of my job is getting to work with kids. I love doing the junior ranger program and getting to talk to them about, you know, the plants and the wildlife and all of those things because they are just so genuinely excited and that is so heartwarming. People who come here as adults or with families or whatnot, you know, it's the first time they've seen the park. This is, this is normal, right? This is a K National Park the way it always has been the way it always will be, right? Um, whereas if you were to give someone experience when they were young and then allow them to come back later and witness the changes that have been wrought, you know, changes wrought by human activity, then that makes, you know, all these narratives in the news we read, that makes it personal then. Because now it's it's not just something abstract, it's not some scientific concept, it's it's place that they love themselves that is being impacted. Throughout my volunteer work, working with conservation, it's always been sort of that outreach, that public outreach a little bit. So that's my motivation. It's just being able to connect people to nature a little bit more so they appreciate it more. The more you appreciate something, the more you want to take care of it. So that's the whole idea for me. It's just being able to do that as much as I can. So I'm Austin Miller. I'm working through the Student Conservation Association as an intern for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So the Student Conservation Association is a separate entity from local organizations. It's a nonprofit, and they partner with these local organizations to be able to give interns and local youth the internship opportunities all across the country. So the main portion of our job here is to go to our monitor our sites that we're assigned. So it's DC wildlife management areas in, you know, along the eastern Lake Ontario area. And we monitor it, we you know, help with keeping it pristine by cleaning up trash, taking down structures and things like that. And you know, we also try to have some public outreach with the community as well as monitor for certain shorebirds and just kind of keep an eye on populations and things like that. 
So right now, the piping plovers, they're in federally endangered and state endangered uh, shorebird. The only nests right now are at Sandy Pond. We constantly monitor them, monitor the behavior, and make sure they're healthy and just see what they're doing. We ban the new chicks and the adults so we can track them, see where they go, and see where they migrate to. A lot of Lakeview is also not just the dunes, but it's also what's, uh, it also goes back all the way to Route 3 in certain sections. So it goes back quite a ways, and it's just about protecting every part of this ecosystem, the dunes, the wetlands, the upland. If you're in a different career, and you think you might want to do this instead, it's possible to do it, and uh, don't feel hesitant about doing it. The opportunities are there if you're willing to find them. My name is Raina Jane, and I'm the founder of Queen Bee and Hive Garden. I'm 18 years old. I'm a sophomore at the University of Connecticut. The root cause of the reason why bees are dying is because of colony collapse disorder, which are be caused by varroa mites. And so that was the start of my project in HiveGuard, which is what developed now, is a device to eliminate varroa mite infestations from honeybee hives. So this is how the product looks like. It's pretty much a 3D printed block with holes, coated with a chemical called thymol. And thymol is a varroicide commonly found in nature. It's derived from the plant called thymus, which is why I chose it to be the basic premise of the product, because it's one of the most all natural products that exist on the market. And so the premise is that as bees pass through the holes of the entranceway, they pick up uh, micrograms of the thymol per pass and eventually it reaches the LC50 of the varroa mite in which basically means that the parasite will be guaranteed death but the honeybee is left unharmed um, and the product is also temperature independent does not uh, harm the honeybee in any way and does not contaminate the honey as well. My family for a long time has always taught me that you start living your life when you live for others, when you start giving back. Um, and for a long time, just, just as a teenager who had these huge aspirations, a lot of it was just about myself. Um, but just like I mentioned before, live and let live is one of the principles I've been grown, grown up with and something that I still can't get out of my head. And so when, when, you, when you see that you're making an actual impact, something that's tangible, something that you can see and feel, it, it not only makes you feel happy, but you realize that you are making an actual change on the world. And um, I, to see that, I think, gives me the, the most satisfaction. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to ever stop. So. When we have wildlife living within a system, when we have wildlife living within a forest or wildlife with, living within a wetland, that those species are indicators of the health of that system. So people really have this idea, or we, we live in this way as if we're on top of the environment, as if we're something separate. But in reality, we're all part of the environment. We're all part of the same ecosystem. And the Center for Wildlife is really a place that teaches people that. And it's a place where people can learn how to regain that in their communities and personally. My name is Emily. I work at the Center for Wildlife uh, in the medical clinic section. And we take in injured and orphaned wildlife of a lot of different species. We take in birds of prey, we take in small mammals, and we re-release them. Uh, in a much larger, broader uh, aspect, the Center for Wildlife does a lot of education. We do all kinds of programs where we introduce people to wildlife. We want to remove that barrier between the community and the local plants and animals that they coexist with. And they're coming to us on purpose to learn about wildlife. And we can give them the tools to become better conservationists in their everyday lives and to make changes in their behavior and in their family's behavior, in their friends' behavior, and in their communities. Uh, that is the information that we want to arm our youth with so that they can carry it out and create change and sustain change. So it is very, very important to involve youth in conservation. I would argue more important than involving 
um, some of the greater, larger bodies, because the people, the ones moving into the future are youth. They're your community youth. Uh, those are the people that you want to access and are the easiest to access and can be the most effective. My name is Anna Siegel, I am 15 years old, and I am a core member of the coalition Maine Youth for Climate Justice. I write up ideas for, you know, strikes and events when we used to do strikes and events, and then proposals for like endorsing in local elections or climate emergency work and things like that. And then I'm also part of the Sierra Club of Maine political team and I am on the emergency management working group for the Maine Climate Council. My strategy was really just to form close bonds with legislators who I trusted and who reached out to me. And because it was my first time, I focused on only a handful of bills, such as LD99, which was the legislation that mandated uh, the state of Maine to divest from fossil fuels. And that was my main project. I got involved in activism through my passion for wildlife and for birds, uh, mainly because when you really love something, you don't get just to experience the good parts of it. When you really love something, you learn about how it's dying and you learn about how it's declining and you see the bad things even when you're just trying to go outside and look at the things you love. Youth conservation programs and environmental action programs are so important for a number of reasons. One reason being the scale of environmental issues and the gravity of environmental issues really requires all community members to be on board and chipping away and advocating for solutions to these issues. A number of folks and youth are starting to feel this sense of climate anxiety or anxiety brought on by these environmental issues. And environmental action programs and youth conservation efforts are so important at empowering youth so that they can combat that anxiety and see how they can make real world change in their community. The Play in Nature event is something that we coordinated to basically bring more awareness to our Maplewood Nature Center that's set to be built within the next few years. And it's to get kids and families to understand that we have a lot of resources, a lot of organizations are dedicated to work um, getting our planet back together and cleaner. So we wanted to invite families and kids out to basically meet these people, understand what organizations and what kind of work they're doing, and to play games with kids. This is sand. This Maplewood Nature Center has been in progress for a few years now. Um, just in, I'm gonna say it was May, was when the commissioner and our mayor, Lovely Warren, uh, made the announcement that it's official. We are officially going to make this a nature center and we announced our COBOR. So our COBOR is the Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights. So it's the right that every child has. You should be able to do a certain amount of things in nature without any obstruction and any stopping you. And our COBOR is something that we want every kid to experience. So whether it's going on a hike, catching butterflies, being able to play in untainted water, understanding how to take care of your planet. This COBOR was something that we worked on with YVOV, the Seneca Park uh, Zoo, urban ecologists. There were so many committees involved in developing this, took surveys of hundreds of kids around the city to know what they would think they should be able to do by the time they get to be an adult or a teenager. So they just made this announcement, it's official, and it's set to be built within the next three or five years. There's a lot that's been left to want for a lot of kids in the community in regards to nature access. And so after, I think, over a year or two of uh, sending out surveys and, and gathering some information from the community about what people wanted out of Rochester parks, we assembled this Outdoor Bill of Rights, inform the actions of different organizations and policy in Rochester to help make sure that kids have access to the things that they were left wanting. On average, the kids nowadays spend about 10 minutes outside every day, and that's in comparison to 44 hours a week on screen. 
So I think when it comes to education and really getting kids involved in, in becoming stewards of their environment, they have to know what they're talking about. They have to know and experience what it is that we're talking about. A lot of this stuff cannot be learned in the classroom. Sometimes our education, our Earth Explorers program is just taking the kids outside and that's enough. There's been times where it's been very limiting for me where I didn't understand what was going on or I didn't know um, certain things that were nature-based or environmental-based. And it seemed like everybody that was able to talk about it didn't look like me. So I think it's really important to include people and to get a different perspective because we all live here. We all live on this planet, we all live in the city, and we all experience our own version of what nature gives us. My name is Kosi Fiji, and I would consider myself a climate activist. So my role as one of the co-chairs of the Nature-Based Education Consortium's Climate Education started out of opportunity from the network that I'm a part of, the Maine Environmental uh, Education Association uh, Changemaker Network. And so through there, I had a few connections and, you know, just kind of got started with this group. And, um, and then, you know, thing, one thing led to another and then I became the co-chair and some pretty good work came out of that. So I think one thing that definitely motivated me a lot was the fact that um, even though there are a lot of youth of color in the climate movement, they don't get a lot of coverage or a lot of the, um, I guess you could say, um, promotion and um, spotlight that white youth climate activists do. And so for me, it's really just about amplifying my own voice. So that gives a pathway for other youth of color, especially black youth that are really involved in the climate justice movement and maybe not maybe are not involved, but want to be involved, they, they can see, oh, you know, if this person who looks like me is a part of something like this, I could definitely do this as well. In the past, we've known that conservation is place-based and we've tried to figure out how to scale up our successes from place-based conservation up to the global scale. But I think the young generation is starting from this new perspective of conservation at a global scale. If they can dig into the ground and plant their ideas that are coming from a global perspective in local conservation actions, I think they'll be wildly successful. Just like a colony of bees, a colony of humans can make a huge impact. So when you, when you see from the smallest actions that you can take to help the world, help it. If you understand where your water grows or where your water comes from or where your food grows and what is on your food, people will just take better care of themselves. So starting that at a very young age is super important and that will also sow a seed for them to carry it on to someone else and give education to the next generation.